Due to his repeated presence in England throughout his life, Felix Mendelssohn's music became associated with the Victorians. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were admirers of his music and invited him to make music with them a number of times. After his death in 1847, his reputation suffered a dual blow. Wagner published an anti-Semitic screed about Mendelssohn, leading the sea change in his esteem on the continent, and he was held up as part of what was so wrong about the Victorians during the reaction to that period. The Nazis continued the downward trajectory of his reputation, banning all of his music, calling it degenerate because of Mendelssohn's Jewish heritage. Mendelssohn's music was out of the classical canon until the 20th century, when accusations of Victorian over-sentimentality and the outright not banishment were tempered by modern scholarship. If you want to catch up on Mendelssohn's life to this point, I will link the playlist in the eye and in the description box below. One of the civic duties that Mendelssohn had in Leipzig was to compose music for festive days. One of those occasions was the three-day Gutenberg Festival, the 400th anniversary of the invention of printing with movable type by Johannes Gutenberg. Leipzig was a center of the German book trade, and the festival was a good excuse to celebrate the centuries-old trade and the associated guilds. Part of the festival was held in the bustling Leipzig Market Plaza, including a church service, a dedication of a new statue of Gutenberg, and a speech by Raymond Hartle, who likened the inventor to the John the Baptist of the Reformation. For the occasion, Mendelssohn composed one of his Fistigazongs for double brass band and male chorus, spatially separated to generate echo effects in the square. On the day of the premiere, June 24, 1840, the work was performed by a chorus of 200 with 16 trumpets and 20 trombones. It made quite the impression. The most famous number of that work was the second part, Vaterland in Deinen Gowen, which was set to the words of Charles Wesley's Christmas carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, by young organist William H. Cummings in 1856. It was printed in a hymnal in 1861 and began its new life as a Christmas carol. Let's hear the opening of the number, played by an organ with the original score overlaid. Mendelssohn's life as a musician came at a time of the rising middle class. The wealth that found its way into the families of the non-noble class brought with it new leisure time. This new leisure time was occupied by many things, but music making was increasingly popular. During his lifetime, Mendelssohn saw the popularity and availability of the piano in middle class households explode and demand for music for amateurs skyrocket. Mendelssohn met this demand by writing piano miniatures called Lieder ohne Worte, or Songs Without Words. These lyrical works were short and within the reach of an amateur player of the piano. He published eight volumes of Songs Without Words, each consisting of six songs, and were written at various points throughout Mendelssohn's life. The works were part of a romantic tradition of writing short lyrical pieces for the piano, although the specific concept of Song Without Words was new. Mendelssohn himself resisted attempts to interpret the song too literally and objected when his friend Marc Andre Suchet sought to put words to them to make them literal songs. What the music I love expresses to me is not thought too indefinite to put into words, on the contrary, too definite. Mendelssohn made piano duet arrangements of a number of the songs, namely those that became Book 5 and the first song of Book 6, which he presented to the Queen Victoria in 1844. Let's listen to the opening bars of Opus 67, Number 4, which came to be known as the Spinner Lead, or the Spinning Song, for its whirling figurations and repeating melody.
Mendelssohn became close to Swedish soprano Jenny Lind, whom he met in October 1844. She came to the Gavant house a number of times and performed to sold out houses each time. Mendelssohn and Lind began a very close relationship as musical companions, supporting e each other's musical adventures. In 1847, Mendelssohn attended a London performance of Meyerbeer's Robert D Le Diable, an opera that he musically despised, in order to hear Lind's British debut in the role of Alice. The music critic Henry Chorley, who was with him, wrote, I see as I write the smile with which Mendelssohn, whose enjoyment of Madame Lind's talent was unlimited, turned round and looked at me as if a load of anxiety had been taking off his mind. His attachment to Madame Lind's genius as a singer was unbounded, as was his desire for her success. There were no hits of impropriety during Mendelssohn's life, but there have been some rumblings of love letters in current scholarship, mostly unfounded. One of Mendelssohn's undisputed masterworks was his towering oratorio, Elijah. He had discussed an oratorio based on Elijah in the late 1830s with his friend Carl Klingman, which resulted in a partial text that Klingman was unable to finish. Mendelssohn then turned to Julius Schubring, the librettist for his earlier oratorio, St. Paul, who quickly abandoned Klingemann's work and produced his own text that combined the story of Elijah as told in the Book of Kings with Psalms. In 1845, the Birmingham Festival commissioned an oratorio from Mendelssohn, who worked with Schubring to put the text in final form, and in 1845 and 1846, composed his oratorio to the German and English texts in parallel, taking care to change musical phrases to suit the rhythms and stresses of the translation by William Bartholomew, a chemist who was also an experienced amateur poet and composer. Bartholomew was also the one to suggest an overture to Mendelssohn, who wanted to start off the oratorio with a stark recitative from Elijah. Bartholomew suggested that the overture could come after the recit to set up the first chorus. Mendelssohn acquiesced to the request and fashioned the overture. The oratorio was first performed on August 26, 1846 at Birmingham Town Hall in its English version, conducted by the composer as the pinnacle of a six-concert festival. The performing forces were massive, 125 orchestral players and 271 chorus members. The performance was an unqualified triumph with eight numbers, four arias and four choruses encored. Elijah was immediately acclaimed as a classic of the genre. The Times critic wrote, Never was there more complete a triumph, never more thoroughly and speedy recognition of a great work of art. Notwithstanding the work's triumph, Mendelssohn revised his oratorio wholesale before another group of performances in London in April 1847, one in the presence of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. Prince Albert inscribed in German a libretto for the oratory Elijah in 1847 to the noble artist who, surrounded by the ball worship of false art, has been able, like a second Elijah, through the genius and study, to remain true to the service of true art. Elijah reflects Mendelssohn's lifelong love of Handel and Bach through a historicism now blended subtly into the composer's mature style. In its lyricism and use of orchestral color and choral color, the style clearly reflects Mendelssohn's own genius as an early romantic composer. The oratorio opens up with a dramatic proclamation by Elijah declaring the drought. This elides directly into the overture, which continues without break into the first chorus, Help Lord. The first chorus has the flavor of Handel, with a straightforward declamation in the voice parts and the arpeggiation in the orchestra. Let's hear the transition from the overture to the first chorus.
On May 14, 1847, Fanny Mendelssohn Hensel died in Berlin of complications from a stroke suffered while rehearsing one of her brother's cantatas, the first Walpurgis Night. When Mendelssohn was told of his sister's death, he shrieked and fainted onto the ground. He fled Frankfurt for Switzerland, where he did little except paint watercolors. He soon returned to composition, preferring the routine to brooding. Six months later, Mendelssohn suffered a series of strokes that rendered him speechless for a time, accompanied by intense headaches. He suffered a last stroke and passed on November 4th, 1847. He was 38. His grandfather Moses, Fanny, and both his parents had all died from similar strokes. A grand funeral was held in Leipzig where a procession of thousands of mourners slowly wound the streets of Leipzig. Felix's funeral was held in the Palgenkircher in Leipzig and it was buried in Berlin Kreitzberg with Fanny and his parents. The pallbearers included Moschelis, Schumann, and Niels Gade. Directly after his death, Mendelssohn was mourned as a genius and a virtuosi. However, it was only a few years after his death that his reputation began a downward slide. Wagner, once an admirer turned constant critic, damned Mendelssohn with faint praise in his incendiary anti-Jewish pamphlet, Das Judium in der Musik, or Jewishness in Music. Mendelssohn has shown us that a Jew may have the amplest store of specific talents, may own the finest and most varied culture, the highest and tenderest sense of honor, yet without all these preeminences helping him, were it but one single time to call forth in us that deep, that heart-searching effect which we await from art. The washiness and whimsicality of our present musical style has been pushed to its utmost pitch by Mendelssohn's endeavor to speak out of vague and almost nugatory content as interestingly and spiritedly as possible. By the early 20th century, many critics, including Bernard Shaw, began to contend Mendelssohn's music for his association with the Victorian cultural insularity. Shaw in particular complained of the composer's kid glove gentility, his conventional sentimentality, and his despicable oratorio mongering. This rejection of Victorianism led to a rejection of Mendelssohn as the Victorian composer of choice. The rejection of Mendelssohn was completed by the Third Reich, when its Reich music commerce cited Mendelssohn's Jewish origin in banning performance and publication of his works. Under the Nazis, Mendelssohn was presented as a dangerous accident of musical history, who played a decisive role in rendering German music in the 19th century degenerate. The Nazis removed the statue of Mendelssohn in front of the Gewandhaus, House, smashing it to pieces. It was not restored until 2008. Appreciation of Mendelssohn's work has developed over the last 50 years, together with the publication of a number of biographies placing his achievements in context. Mercer Taylor comments on the irony that this broad-based re-evaluation of Mendelssohn's music is made possible in part by a general disintegration of the idea of musical canon, an idea which Mendelssohn, as a conductor, pianist, and scholar, had done so much to establish. Mendelssohn's works, including his concert overtures, symphonies, and oratorios, are now heard regularly in concert houses around the world. Thank you for joining me in this series about the life of Mendelssohn. If you'd like to learn more about the composer, a really great short biography is The Life of Mendelssohn by Peter Mercer Taylor. This slim volume can be found at your local library, which is where I found the copy I read. Like this video, give it a thumbs up, and subscribe to the channel for more. What do you want to learn about next? Leave me a comment down below. You can also support the making of these videos on Patreon. I get no ad revenue due to the use of musical examples, so Patreon is a great way to show your support. The bibliography for this video can be found on my website, dominicroyam.com. Interested in seeing my process? I document it on my social media, so follow me for more updates. Thanks again, and see you in my next video.